From Microbe TV, this is Beyond the Noise, episode number 86, recorded on November 24th, 2025. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today is your host, Dr. Paul Offit. Hi, Vincent. Hello, Paul. This is the video version of Paul's column on Substack called Beyond the Noise, cutting to the chase on important health topics. Today, we're going to talk about Paul's latest column, which is called CDC 1946 to 2025 RIP. So recently, some changes were made to a section of the CDC website on, on called vaccines and autism. Tell us about those changes. So um, I should go back to the beginning. So, so earlier this year, the, during the second confirmation hearing to be Secretary of Health and Human Services, William Cassidy was the head of that committee, the Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee. And he ultimately voted yes to confirm RFK Jr. as secretary. And to reassure us, to reassure the medical and scientific community, he held up a piece of paper, a piece of paper like this, in which he said that he would have uh, an unprecedentedly close collaborative working relationship with RFK Jr. Mr. Kennedy um, and the administration uh, committed that he and I would have an unprecedentedly close collaborative working relationship if he is confirmed. And then listed a number of things that RFK Jr. had agreed to do. One of the things that he agreed to do was it said, quote, the CDC will not remove statements on their website pointing out that vaccines do not cause autism. CDC will not remove statements on their website pointing out that vaccines do not cause autism. So that's what RFK Jr. proceeded to do. He changed the website under vaccines and autism to basically make the point that we hadn't proven that vaccines hadn't caused autism. And the statement specifically was now on the new website. The claim, quote, vaccines do not cause autism is not an evidence-based claim because studies have not ruled out the possibility that infant vaccines cause autism. So he wanted to leave the door open that vaccines could cause autism, which really was in direct con conflict with a, a, an agreement that he had made with Senate, Senator Cassidy months earlier. So have we heard from Senator Cassidy on, on this change to the website? Senator Cassidy has been asked on both podcasts and on national media uh, programs about this. Did you feel duped? Do you feel that RFK Jr. has crossed an important line? And his answer is always the same. He says, I don't like to look backward. I like to look forward. Do you regret supporting his nomination? I mean, you were a key vote that it's put him into this position. So, so I'll answer that because I'm always asked that. Yeah, <laughs> I can imagine so. Yeah. yeah, life is live forward. Boy, that's a cop out, if anything, right? <laughs> Yeah, so does that mean that you're not held accountable for anything that you've done in the past? It's a pretty good. Apparently, deal. yeah. It's crazy. It's just crazy. I mean, this is the whole criminal law is based on stuff that you've done, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. And I'm not even a lawyer. So explain to us why science uh, can't rule out that something doesn't happen. So if you do an epidemiological study, um, you form a hypothesis. And the way it works is the null hypothesis. So for example, if you're looking to determine whether the measles, mumps, rubella, or MMR vaccines cause autism, you form the null hypothesis, which in this case would be MMR vaccine does not cause autism. You can reject that hypothesis or said another way, you can show that, um, that children who have autism are more likely to have it after getting an, MR, an MMR vaccine than not. Or you cannot reject the null hypothesis, which is to say that when autism follows receipt of the MMR vaccine, it's doing it at a level that would be expected by chance alone. But you can't accept the null hypothesis. You can't prove never. You can never prove that something can never happen. And that's just a technicality of the scientific method, but it's being used by RFK Jr. in this case to leave a door open and, frankly, unnecessarily scare parents. So uh, this is what we would call an observational study, right? You're observing uh, people who, um, who have gotten vaccines and you're, and you're observing whether they developed autism or not. So this is a limitation of an observational study, correct? Right. And there's been 24 such studies um, done in seven countries on three continents now involving 
thousands and thousands of children who either did or didn't get that vaccine. And they've done these studies the right way, meaning control for potentially confounding variables like healthcare seeking behavior or socioeconomic background or medical background. And they all find the same thing, which is that, that you're not more likely to get autism if you've gotten that vaccine than or if you hadn't. But the way the scientific method works, you can't say now that it's not possible. They could have done a hundred studies or a thousand studies or a million studies. You still can't say it's not possible. But I would argue that once you've done 24 studies done by a variety of different investigators, I think you can safely say a truth has emerged. So I think you can say that vaccines don't cause autism, even though technically the scientific method doesn't allow you to say that. So there have been 24 studies with millions of children, right? Well, there are at least thousands and thousands of children, yes. Yeah, and it's just particular a Dutch study or a Danish study, I think, it had many, many children enrolled in. So no association. So this is the correct way to say it. there's no association between vaccination and the development of autism, right? And you know what's interesting about that, the way you say that, is that about 25 years ago, Dan Burton, a Republican congressman uh, from Indiana, held a hearing to look at whether or not vaccines cause autism. This was right around the time that Andrew Wakefield had published his paper in The Lancet in 1998, claiming that MMR vaccine caused autism, based on a series of eight children who developed autism within a month or so of getting that vaccine. So he was on one panel, Andrew Wakefield was on one panel, and I was on another. And I was being asked to basically evaluate the biological plausibility of why that would or wouldn't be true. The person sitting to my left was a woman named Colleen Boyle, who was a, a veteran CDC researcher. And she said just what you said when, when asked the question, that all the evidence doesn't support the, the fact that, that MMR causes autism. But that made Dan Burton angry, really angry. He screamed at her. He said, so you can't tell me it doesn't cause it, can you? You can't tell me that it doesn't cause it because you just don't know, do you? And um, I think what happens is because we're, we're faithful to the scientific method is that's not often how it's heard by the general public. So you said before it is we've done so many studies that it is now reasonable to say vaccines do not cause autism, right? Yes, I think it is reasonable to say that. And of course, what they're saying on the new CDC website is that that statement is not an evidence-based claim, but in fact it is because so many observational studies have been done. Yes, I agree. So basically, RFK Jr., assuming he is responsible for this change, and that's a reasonable assumption, he's taking he it. He is. RFK Jr. has said he's responsible for this change. Okay. So he's taking advantage of the limitations of observational studies, and there's Parents should understand there's nothing new. It's it's the same data that we've been looking at for years. That's right. But you wonder whether they will see it that way. I mean, I certainly have had calls from friends who are pediatricians who have now uh, had, had calls from their uh, parents. Now they're a little more worried that, as if there's been new data that have shown that um, you know that vaccines do cause autism when that's not true at all. This was just... Um, RFK Jr. inserting his, you know, fixed immutable belief, science-resistant belief that vaccines cause autism now into the CDC website. And so I think you can't trust the CDC website anymore or the CDC, frankly, or the ACIP anymore. You can't trust those those agencies, which is a shame because the CDC was arguably um, the, uh, the a primary public health agency in this country, an excellent public health agency that's been shredded by a man who has a non-falsifiable hypothesis that vaccines cause autism. He's speaking like a lawyer, which is what he is, and not as a scientist, which he is not. He doesn't want to know the difference between an observational study and a placebo-controlled double-blinded study, for example. Which brings up the question, Paul, could one do a placebo-controlled double-blinded trial where you enroll kids and you give half of them vaccines and the other half you don't give vaccines and you observe them over the next five years and see who develops autism. Is that possible to do? No, it's not an ethical study. I mean, right. measles, we currently have a measles epidemic that has killed three people in this country and is the biggest epidemic we've had in more than 30 years. You can't knowingly, prospectively not vaccinate children with measles-containing vaccine. That is not an ethical thing to do because some of those children may suffer measles, may be hospitalized with measles, may go to the intensive care unit with measles or die with measles. You can't leave that to the a flip of a coin. It's not ethical. Right. Okay. So the proper way to do a trial is ethically 
which is you cannot withhold a treatment that is known to be beneficial, correct? That's right. But but even technically a placebo-controlled trial, a huge placebo-controlled trial or a thousand placebo-controlled trials, even if you did that, that still doesn't prove that it's not possible, that you can, because you can never prove sure. never. Well, you know, as we saw with the COVID vaccines, you know, when we looked at 40,000 people, we didn't see side effects. But then when we looked at 100,000, we saw them, right? So, but, but you know, Paul, if it's one in a million, that doesn't account for the current autism frequency. So y you have to do things that are biologically and clinically plausible in the end. And, and RFK Jr. is just not doing that because he has an agenda. He has, he has a uh, ideology and uh, he wants to do everything he can. This is the problem with putting someone like him in charge of public health in this country. Right. So what changes that? I mean, how many more children have to suffer before somebody stands up for the health and well-being of these children and say, says enough? Just well, you said before that uh, the CDC is no longer trustable. And the thing is, there are still good scientists at CDC, but we don't trust that whatever they find is going to be relayed in a trustable way, right? Well, the people who were involved with uh, vaccines had no idea this was about to happen when right. RFK Jr. changed that website because he's just weaponizing the CDC to further his political ends. So would it ever be possible to say that chicken nuggets do not cause autism? No, nope, you can't say that either. And, and I think in fairness, he should have added that to the website and said that we, we, we don't now know whether chicken nuggets cause autism, nor will we ever be able to prove that they don't. We'll never be able to prove that. Or anything, in fact. He says he's on a quest to find the causes of autism, but by his own uh, way of approaching science, you'll never be able to know, right? No, the, the sad thing in this is that he didn't, you know, just stumble upon autism. I mean, autism was first described in 1943. And there's a lot of interesting work on the cause or causes of autism. And you know that there is a genetic component. You know that there are certain environmental factors that affect autism. You know that, that uh, women during pregnancy, if they take valproic acid, uh, an anti-seizure medicine, and a drug that's also used to treat bipolar dis disorder and migraine headaches, that that also increases your risk of autism clearly. You know that rubella infection, ironically, uh, during mm -hmm. pregnancy, increases your risk of autism. And so making statements against the MMR vaccine, if anything, only increases the risk if you keep getting people uh, not trying to convince people not to give that vaccine. I mean, you know that you know that paternal age is, matters. You know that maternal age matters. And we're older now when we have children than we were 50 years ago. Mm. So all those add to autism. I understand also that having fever during pregnancy uh, correlates with autism. Right. So, so here you have all these interesting leads, you know, genetic, environment, um, mm -hmm. uh, maternal health, uh, et cetera. And all this does is just, just shunt money away and, and attention away and interest away from those promising leads to this, this arguably best studied environmental factor, which is vaccines, which has consistently been shown not to cause autism because he just has this fixed belief. So what he does is he does a disservice to families of children with autism and their siblings because he directs this money away from better leads. And all of this is based on the, the clearly discredited Wakefield study a long time ago, right? Would you say that that's the origin of all of this? Yes. I think that in 1998, when Andrew Wakefield published that case series of eight children who developed signs and symptoms of autism within a month of getting vaccines, that that, that raises. And, and that paper was eventually retracted by The Lancet because it was shown that Andrew Wakefield had basically misrepresented clinical and biological data, that he'd received uh, money from a legal services commission basically to launder legal claims through a medical journal when uh, parents of five of those eight children were in the midst of suing pharmaceutical companies. He also had a patent on a safer measles vaccine. And when all that became uh, evident, 10 of the 13 uh, co-authors on his study absented themselves from that paper and eventually the Lancet retracted it. But you can't unring the bell. You know, once you scare people, it's hard to unscare them. So even though the Lancet retracted that paper, you still have introduced that fear. So you, you've mentioned this before, but I think this is a good way to close. What do you think this revised CDC page, uh, will? what kind of effect will it have on uh, vaccine uptake in the U.S.? 
Well, vaccine uptake is already eroding. That's why we're seeing these outbreaks of measles and bigger outbreaks of influenza and whooping cough. I think this will only further do that. I mean, to the extent that people look at the CDC website, um, there may be some physicians out there who glance at this and think there, there's new data to suggest that maybe vaccines do, do cause autism, which isn't true. Um, you know, in this this new revision, there's no uh, reference to all the studies that show that it doesn't cause autism. Um, and so I think it just further stokes fears at a time when we're seeing more vaccine preventable diseases in the last few decades than we've seen in a long time. We'll put a link to this column in the show notes so you can read it for yourself. That's Beyond the Noise with Dr. Paul Offit. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Vincent.